Hey guys, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel. And in this video, we're going to be doing a reading vlog of less common writing advice books. Less common on author two. Not necessarily less common as the first one that we're going to discuss is Zen and the Art of Writing by Ray Bradbury. <laughs> Very popular writing advice book, though really as I'm reading it, it's just a collection of essays, a love letter to writing in a lot of ways. I have so many feelings. <laughs> and I actually stopped on the Zen and the Art of Writing essay, which is 82% of the way through the book. I always love when a book is titled after one of the essays in it. So anyways, other books that I may or may not be reading during this vlog, depending on how absurdly long it gets, is Craft in the Real World by Matthew Salasis. The subtitle is Rethinking Fiction Writing and Workshopping. And I also have Talking About Detective Fiction by P.D. James, Where the Past Begins by Amy Tan, and Crafting the Personal Ooh. Essay by Denti W. Moore. Wow. <laughs> and this video is being sponsored by Skillshare, so I will be sure to talk about them later on in the video. Now, I have barely been able to film this intro as I want to get back to Zen and the Art of Writing. Let's freaking do this. Oh, hello. You. <laughs> Reflection. Oh. Literally the first line is, I selected the above title quite obviously for its shock value. And he's acknowledging it, yes. Literally got up for a second to get the camera and she's already like, my seat now. Mm-hmm. For I believe that eventually quantity will make for quality. Michelangelo's, Da Vinci's, Tintoretto's, Zillion sketches, the quantitative prepared them for the qualitative single sketches further down the line. Single portraits, single landscapes of incredible control and beauty. A great surgeon dissects and redissects a thousand, ten thousand bodies, tissues, organs, preparing thus by quantity the time when quality will count with a living creature under his knife. On and on and on it goes. I think this is a really interesting point as I feel like uh, the writing world or perhaps just our little author tube subsection of the writing world is kind of coming to head once again about the huge word count goals and counting by words and all this stuff. And I've seen more and more comments both on my channel and on other people's channels talking about how we should be focusing on quality rather than just writing a lot of words. This also happens during NaNoWriMo months, which might be part of the reason. And while I think we should always try to write with quality in mind, I appreciate that Ray Bradbury has this whole point to quote, from experience alone can quality come. One man's take. Oh wow, the end of this essay. Be pragmatic then. If you're not happy with the way your writing has gone, you might give my method a try. If you do, I think you might easily find a new definition for work. And the word is love. Holy shit. That's a good end. Since throughout this whole piece, he's been basically repeating what he posited at the start. Work, don't think, and relaxation in any order. So I had actually started this book when I was on my trip to Vegas and I took so many screenshots from the air of things that were really important and stood out to me. Um, I also took them on the way back from Vegas too. When I first read Fahrenheit 451, I think I talked about this in the Cooking with Classics I did, I had a hard time getting into Ray Bradbury's writing. And I say a hard time, like it took maybe 30 pages um, of just being like, I don't know how I feel about this writing. And after that moment, I fell in love. I love how rhythmic his writing is. I find his writing to be very inspiring, not necessarily even the worlds he creates or anything like that, but the actual writing is so beautiful to me in a way that I don't think I'd ever be able to achieve, but that I would love to attempt to emulate. Um, not for everything, but for some things, you know, just to try. So getting to read Zen and the Art of Writing was a beautiful experience for me beyond the actual meaning behind his words. I just like reading what he says. <laughs> so for instance, some bits I highlighted because I thought they were concepts that I loved. And then other times it was just in the tomb yards where the butterflies settled like flowers on the graves and where the flowers blew away like butterflies over the stones. And I was just like, holy shit. I love the range of topics this book covers because they are essays each 
Uh, well, it all goes together quite clearly. That's why they made it into one whole book. The essays themselves really can stand alone. But early on, he's talking about the art itself. And I love how he says, you know, art can't save us from the world's problems, but it can revitalize us amidst it all. And you must stay drunk on writing so reality cannot destroy you. During a previous vlog, I mentioned how I really enjoyed William Zinser's On Writing Well. And one of the reasons is that he continually updates that book. And so what I love is he makes the point that, you know, 30 years ago when he first published the book, he used lots of he's, him's. That's really all he did because that's what used to be the common way of saying a person, but like the man and whatever. Um, so all of the examples were he, him. And now he incorporates she. He tries not to be stereotypical in which one he chooses and he chooses a random kind of thing. And I appreciate that. And I love that that is the way that we are moving forward. Obviously, Zen in the Art of Writing was not quite there yet. Um, and in fact, you can see when he uses examples of famous writers later, uh, you can kind of pinpoint when the essay was actually written because he starts using like Emily Dickinson as an example instead of just all men. Um, so anyways, just an interesting thing to note. One of those perhaps more telling of the time than of Ray Bradbury himself. The faster you blurt, the more swiftly you write, the more honest you are. He talks about writing at least a thousand words a day every day from the age of 12 on. And he actually talks about later, I don't know if I highlighted it, that detective fiction took him 30 years to figure out how he'd actually to do it. Oh, here it is. That might say 40 years, actually. He has a whole bit about reading poetry, which I think is why I love his work so much, but I believe it's read poetry, read essays, and read a short story every day, and that will improve your writing. Anyways, this is absolutely a book that I want to buy in a physical form so that I may put it on my shelf. I just so enjoyed this reading process. In fact, one of the last chapters he has is poems, and I think this really speaks to just how I've always felt about things. You know, as much as I appreciate Ray Bradbury as a writer, I did like three of the poems that he had there. They spoke to me, but of course, um, I think he had six, maybe seven, in total in the back and the other three or four didn't speak to me at all. Like I appreciated what he had done and I find poems to be really hard so I knew that it took work to make them as succinct um, as they did but they just didn't speak to me, right? So I I always love having an example of that from writers that I enjoy where it's like not everything's gonna click with you. So anyways, this book basically just had everything that I wanted. It was inspiring. It covered um, lots of stories over the whole lifetime of his career and the advice was sometimes practical but maybe mostly more inspirational. So anyways. Cannot recommend it enough, Zen Art of Writing. And now a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. For those of you who don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. One of the classes I've taken recently that I've loved is Yasmin Cheyenne's Writing for Self-Discovery, Six Journaling Prompts for Gratitude and Growth. She starts it off by making you like fill out this pie chart looking thing of all of the time you spend doing every activity and then finding these little bits of time about 15 minutes that you could use to journal and I found this really helpful especially as I was going through these writing craft books because so many of them mention writing as a catharsis and pulling stuff out of your own journal and of your own life and so using these sort of daily prompts is a really great way to tap into that. If I had to choose a favorite it was probably prompt three redefining success and one of the things that I love that she mentioned that I never considered before was incorporating art or photography into your journaling, um, which has just inspired a couple of ideas that I think I want to try out. So anyways, her class is wonderful, as is Jonathan Van Ness's The Ultimate Self-Care Playbook, Discover and Nurture Your Centered Self. And one of the other things I really appreciate about Skillshare is that they also have these workshops where you can, you know, do the work with some other people all at the same time. So I'm excited to take Write a Successful Blog in 2021, share your stories, grow your audience. And Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so that means there's no ads. And they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow your creativity wherever it takes you. And and right now they're running a special promo. So the first 1000 people who click my link down below will get an entire month free trial of Skillshare. So you can also check out Yasmin's class and maybe we can sort of like exchange prompts, journal prompts. Yes, but thank you once again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and now back to the books. That means it is time to switch over to craft in the real world. But also I 
uh, found Consider This, an audiobook format by Chuck Palahniuk. Moments in my writing life after which everything was different. All I really know about Chuck is that he wrote Fight Club. That being said, I'm driving to San Marcos today, which on a good day is over an hour on a bad day, two hours away from me, depending on traffic. So audiobook listening it is. Let's go over contents. Part one, fiction in the real world. Part two, workshop in the real world. And then an appendix with exercises. I have already read the preface, but I'm going to reread it as I thought it was really wonderful the first time and it's been a month or two. It begins with, this book is a challenge to accepted models of craft and workshop, to everything from a character-driven plot to the cone of silence or gag rule that in a creative writing workshop silences the manuscript's author. The challenge is this, to take craft out of some imaginary vacuum, as if meaning in fiction is separate from meaning in life, and return it to its cultural and historical context. Race, gender, sexuality, etc. affect our lives and so must affect our fiction. Real-world context, and particularly what we do with that context, is craft. Other bits I really loved in the preface, we must reject the mystification, mythification of creative writing. The mystical writer uses the myth of his genius to gain power, all about making craft accessible and inclusive. Ben, this is a library book. You're not allowed to do that. Thank you. Novels are about social identity, mass production, the economy of art, and so on. But unlike in life, in fiction, <laughs> class and race and gender, etc. are choices. That is, they are a part of craft. To become a better writer is to make conscious what may start as unconscious. She just loves this thing so much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matthew goes on about a bunch of historical context in writing workshops, but I really loved his garden example. He's talking about the common refrain that writers uh, learning in this sort of traditional creative writing workshop setting must be quiet and just take criticism. Imagine, for example, a conversation about gardening in which other gardeners look at your garden and tell you about it without allowing you to talk about your attempts to grow it. This conversation is at best underinformed. It is likely to mislead. It could easily end up harmful to both the garden and even the gardener's desire to garden, especially if the other gardeners have experience in a different kind of garden or with different plants or with different climate or soil, etc. He also goes on to say that one of the biggest downsides of the traditional way the way it's always been done in workshops is taking out the context of who the book is for. I've experienced a writing workshop before when I was in uh, college. Our on-campus writing organization would spend the first bit of time reading and critiquing each other's work in small groups. But what I learned from that was that you know, not everyone's gonna get your book, and not the least of which because they might not even read the genre that you write in. So at the barest level, it's always helpful to have a workshop of people who do enjoy your genre. You know, that's the advice we're given for beta readers and for critique partners. So I'm really excited to learn more about workshopping as I feel like I know very little. But I think I will predominantly be listening to Consider This, Moments in My Writing Life After Which Everything Was Different, written by Chuck Palahniuk. To Tom Stanbauer, with gratitude. At each of our three sessions, students assembled, read their work, and waited. Everyone looked to the editor to the stars, who would sigh deeply and ask us to comment on the work in question. This strategy allowed the other students to feel smart while it ran out the clock. Mix first, second, and third person points of view. Everyone should use three types of communication. Three parts description, two parts instruction, one part automatopoeia. Mix to taste. I'm enjoying this book so far. It is a lot more um, potentially prescriptive than I've heard other writing advice books. It definitely leads you toward emulating a certain style. It was really interesting reading Matthew's book and Chuck's book at the same time because they had very divergent feelings on kind of what the responsibility of the writer was in some instances. I think I clipped part of Chuck's to share in this vlog, but Matthew talks about character arc versus the story arc and basically how those are different things and what the writer is saying with those different things is important. So just very fascinating to kind of see that juxtaposition.
I need to take a break from reading real quick to make an update um because I thought it was really interesting I'm on what is craft 25 thoughts the first chapter was phenomenal I took a lot of <laughs> notes on it and then he reinforced that with this next chapter where literally the first lesson is craft as a set of expectations and we basically go over how are those expectations set but number 12 we have come to teach plot as a string of causation in which the protagonist desires move the action forward. The craft of fiction has come to adopt the term Freytag's triangle, which were meant to apply to drama, and of Aristotle's poetics, which were meant to apply to Greek tragedy. I talk about Freytag's pyramid a lot because that's basically the extent of which I outline something uh, before I zero draft, or that's been my process in the past. So I was like, ooh, perked up at this. Exposition, inciting incident, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution, denouement. But to think of plot and story shape in this way is cultural and represents the dominance of a specific cultural tradition. In contrast, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese stories have developed from a four act rather than a three or five act structure. In Japanese, it is called Kishoten Ketsu, Key Introduction, Show Development, Ten Twist, Ketsu Reconciliation. Western fiction can often be boiled down to A wants B and C gets in the way of it. I draw this shape for my students. A wants B, but C gets in the way of it. I'm just, I'm so excited to read more of this book. I'm not particularly far into it, I think I actually read this section as I was browsing it in the library and was one of the reasons that I knew I had to pick it up. But this is something that I find you have to interact with the text a lot more than other writing craft books. You know, Matthew is positing all of these things and is walking through it and explaining it. Um, and because we're so embedded in our own culture and history, you're basically trying to take what he's saying and look back in your own um life and how you've learned about writing in the stories you've read so i think it just takes more mental capacity to read this so what i've been doing is i've been taking breaks i think about it a lot and then i come back to it it's only 216 pages so if i'm on page 28 i'm over 10 percent of the way through the book i feel like it's everything that the preface promised um and just it's so much more <laughs> that being said really enjoying it gonna go ahead and get back to it and now of course they're all together Part two, workshop in the real world, the reader versus POC. So I just finished the chapter on who's at the center of workshops and who should be. It basically sets up how he went about uh, changing the old methods of doing workshopping and even the resistance he encountered. But I really love his philosophy on asking questions to the author rather than immediately telling the author what you thought of things um and he makes the point that it brings the focus back to the author where before they'd basically been silent they had the gag rule for most of traditional workshopping so anyways i'm very excited to see this i did take a sneak peek again at uh here we go the table of contents so I'm on alternative workshops. Then we have the syllabus example, workshopping incomplete drafts against page limits, four things to grade. His appendix exercises I wanted to point out just because it's the thing that got me excited as I was flipping through. Purpose-oriented writing exercises, that's about seven pages. But then 34 revision exercises, which you can see the page differential there. I am just so excited for what is in store, so. Trying not to spoil myself too much, but very cool. I am gonna switch back to uh, consider this while I do some chores. Um, I wanted to point out how Chuck also had a huge section talking about workshopping. It kind of goes in and out of the stories that he's telling, but I'm finding it really interesting. He actually opened up that book. I think I got a piece of that while I was driving, talking about a bad workshopping experience he had. So. It's one of those where <laughs> workshopping to me sounds like something that could be so incredibly beneficial if you find the right workshopping group and take 
the tips in here in order to like figure out how to correctly establish one and center the author again and figure out who the intended audience is for the story. So anyway, it's just very cool to think about. Okay, back to consider this. It becomes more and more erratic and the narrator is forced into such denial. Different. Or you can keep the action flowing and increase the momentum of the energy by using a regular series of unlikely conjunctions. If you were my student, I tell you to listen to a child. Listen to someone who's terrified of being interrupted. I wanted to play you that one bit because it is the one annoyance I have with this book is the repeated use of if you were my student. And I'm trying to think of a better way you could phrase that in like visual format. It might work better. I don't know how the paperback or hardback is formatted so it might have been bolded and your eyes can kind of gloss over it. But hearing the audiobook narrator say it over and over again is so frustrating. <laughs> I'm just like, I know if I was your student. I texted myself an idea that I got while I was listening to the audiobook. That was just one of several ideas. I think in part because it's so prescriptive, what I want to do is just play around with the advice that he's giving. And it, he does a really wonderful job of providing examples on how to do the exact thing. So that part I just cut off, he was saying, use conjunction words, but make it a like, unusual conjunction word. That's such a specific piece of advice that is just so fascinating to me. I really haven't heard it much before. If I did hear it, it had fully escaped my brain and this feels like the first time I'm hearing. <laughs> and that's wonderful because it immediately is like, oh, maybe I could attempt to write a short story and really put that one specific piece of advice into effect. But he's given like, at this point in the book, you know, over two hours in, almost halfway, 50, 100, I don't even know. It's fascinating. <laughs> he definitely does have an air of like, not necessarily this is how everyone should write, but like kind of close to that. I don't know that the advice he's giving is everyone's style, um, but I do think everyone could play around with it and take something else away from it, if that makes sense. So anyways, I'm really enjoying it. I might be going three for three on this one. <laughs> this is the reason I depict questionable behavior in my work but refuse to endorse or condemn it. Why preclude the wonderful energy of public debate? Often readers respond strongly without grasping why. To avoid this pitfall, build your novel with a number of scenes or chapters that can stand alone as short stories. Magazines and websites can excerpt these and they make a much better advertisement for your book. Plan for the fact that every medium wants free content. As I am almost done with this book, I do want to point out one of the uh, flaws of the audiobook, at least within my overdrive app. I don't know if you can see a postcard from the tour, a postcard from the tour, a postcard from the tour, another postcard from the tour, a postcard from the tour. I imagine in like a paperback hardback kind of format, it makes more sense or even just the ebook, right? Uh, but it's harder to flip through chapters and go back to something because I'm not exactly sure where I heard something or the picture of this. So unless I took a screenshot at the exact time where I was like, I need to come back it is lost. But this does bring up that I will probably buy a copy of the book. I think I'm going to buy a copy of all of the books if I can find them. But I did want to play one last part for you guys. It is during the troubleshoot your fiction section where basically he's like, uh, you know, try all of the things I've already told you, do all of the hints, all of the tips, all of the prescriptive advice. And eventually once you've mastered all those, you can go back to doing whatever you want, but ideally get this stuff down. You know, if you've done that, and you're still having problems, here's what it might be. Problem. Your work fails to attract an agent, editor, or audience. Consider, does that really matter? It does it? I think that's very telling as throughout the book, he's talked about how important writing is to just be something that you have to really enjoy yourself and not be in it for the fame or the money or whatever else. I loved his tidbit about all of his journeys along book tours, the random asides. Uh, yes, it's very entertaining. What Tom would call moment after which everything is different. Oh, we got to it. We did it. The reason for the title. <laughs> okay, this one is fascinating. I would love to see it actually happen. Like, I want to bear witness. <laughs> I love that he's including his syllabus as an example here and that he recommends reading it through twice, once just for enjoyment and the second time focusing on things like this. Oop, very cool. Also, I clearly switched to pizza, which Buffy wants and is not allowed to have. 
Holy shit, this is so good. I loved, as I was nearing the end, I just couldn't put it down. I was enthralled. Um, this covers what I've been asking for from a writing craft book um, in ways that I wasn't actually asking for, that I didn't know I was trying to ask for, but specifically with the 34 revision exercises part, I have been wanting a book that spells out how to revise or gives helpful hints and tips and suggests ways to revise. And this is phenomenal. The first one he starts off with strong, which is just like, if you the writer are bored reading your work, it means it's boring. The stuff we've heard before is, well, you've had to read it so many times. So of course it's like you'd be bored. No, if you the writer are bored, the reader's gonna be bored. Change that. <laughs> Exercise eight, mark each spot a new character enters the story and write an extended introduction for that character, including what they look like, how they're dressed, what objects are associated with them, any identifying marks, any identifying habits or gestures, their way of seeing things, their attitude toward the world, their age, their ethnicity, their occupation, their family relationships and history, their relationship to the protagonist, another character's opinion of them, their desires, their problems, their faults, etc. Do all of that. He includes a whole rest of the page as he goes in depth about it and then at the very end, the very last scene that that character's in, do the same thing and note how they've changed. I love that. I've seen examples of that before, but nothing nearly that in depth and I've not attempted that myself. So we'll have to try in the future. Number 11, which I never would have thought to do. What are the other possibilities for your story? Underline all the missed opportunities in your manuscript or better yet, have a writing partner do it and suggest stuff. Like, anyways, it's, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Of the three writing craft books, and they're all so different, so I don't really want to put them together, but if you're like, I have 20 bucks and I can only buy one of them, um, you know, if your library doesn't have one and you thought all of these sounded cool, I would recommend Craft in the Real World. I have plans to get all of them. Uh, I was slightly foiled today, <laughs> but I shall buy them online because I love them that much. While I was taking notes though, I do wanna say on page six, early on. Here, plenty of writers will feign queasiness over any introduction of politics or literary theory. There is, of course, a kind of writer who believes art is free from the rest of the world, as if he does not live and read and write in that world. There's also a kind of writer who believes that human experience is universal, so his experience is enough to know everyone else's. What's the big deal, these privileged writers will ask. Why not encourage writers to reach a wide mainstream audience? Even if they want to experiment, they should know the tradition first. In other words, you have to know the rules in order to break them. But he has several wonderful examples with why knowing the rules can be very confusing and how that changes with which culture you're writing for and who your target audience is will have a completely different set of rules. So when we're talking vaguely about these rules that everyone should know, no. <laughs> Anyways. This book's so good. It makes me want to come up with a writer's workshop. I want to attend one. I want to have a group. <laughs> There's so many nuggets in here. I can't recommend it enough. I'm gonna stop gushing because this video could potentially go on forever. <laughs> A few other notes on consider this. The examples used in the book are not for the faint of heart. If you've already read any of Chuck's books, I'm sure you probably know that. I haven't read any of Chuck's work before, though I've seen Fight Club and I've heard other people talk about his writing. So I kind of knew what to expect, but yes. Uh, so very graphic, some things that like most people wouldn't be comfortable with potentially, like talking about it in public. There's lots of things. It's very fascinating. He's very entertaining, but just a heads up. Also the end of his book, <laughs> uh, I did love the line, please consider that the next ending will be the happy one when he's talking about his own financial troubles with what happened within his agency. So anyways, very fascinating. I still want a physical copy. <laughs> but please do comment down below. Let me know if you've read Zen in the Art of Writing. Let me know if you've read Craft in the Real World or if you've read Consider This. And also please let me know where you go to check out writing craft books. Where do you get your recommendations for more writing craft books? As I did not read these three that I had mentioned earlier on, I'm gonna have to get back to them at some point. So I'm very excited, more books to read. Let me also know if there's been a piece of writing advice that uh, filled a hole that you didn't know you needed until you heard it. Let me also know if you've read a book um, that really changed the way you thought about writing, whether that is nonfiction or fiction. And let me know if you have an author like Ray Bradbury is for me, who you just find their prose to be so absorbing. Uh, who else do I feel this way about? Oh, Terry Pratchett, phenomenal, amazing. 
N.K. Jemisin, phenomenal, amazing, the kind of people who I feel like I could never possibly get on their level of writing, but that's okay because it's wonderful and I get to read them. But thank you guys so much for watching, thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and thank you especially to some of my new patrons this month. Amelia M, Kristen Toe, Best Jill Ever, Melissa Harney, Mallory Anderson, Wright Lola Wright, and Jasmine, and I'll see you all very soon with a new video. Bye!